In today's video, I'm simply going to be playing a 15 minute plus 10 second rapid game on chess.com, trying to win it obviously on my main account and trying to explain my thought process while I play so you guys can be entertained and maybe even gain some knowledge from me. So with that being said, I just want to give a quick shout out to the Inketo Club who have kindly sent me a very cool t-shirt with a very cool graphic and a hoodie which I will release some shorts on my channel about it soon enough. Um, really cool brand. If you want to get yourself some, then if you use my code Centurion at the checkout, you get a discount. And I think they're really cool. So it's genuine, like decent, decent clothing, decent chess clothing. Uh, with that being said, don't want to push it too hard. Let's get into the chess. Okay, so my opponent, Superman51515 from Indonesia. No, Poland. No, it is Indonesia. I second guessed myself. Goes for d4. So I'm going to play c6 to invite my opponent to go into the Karo Khan. Most likely, he'll play something like c4 or knight f3. I, I'm wrong. I was going to go for the Slav. But that's that's the beauty, right? If you're like a Karo slash Slav player like myself, I think it's really important against d4 or... Yeah, against d4 to play c6 rather than d5. Because then... If you're more comfortable in the Karo rather than the Slav, which I personally am, then we can go into the Karo. There are tons of other videos on my channel, which um, they're all linked in a playlist that will be below that feature the Karo Khan in it, which is an awful lot of them because I love the Karo. So if you're interested, check that out. And he goes for the advanced variation. Now you can play Bishop to F5, which is probably the main line with the idea of playing e6 and locking the bishop outside of the pawn chain. But personally, I like to go for this c5 line where you immediately try to break apart white's center. Because if you play takes, which isn't a bad move, um, but the point is if you take, then your e5 pawn loses its key defender. So we're going to keep applying pressure. Of course, my opponent can take, but then we can take on e5, which is probably beneficial for us. In many of these structures, you do have to watch out for checks along this diagonal. There's many like tricky lines in that. My opponent goes h3, which is a decent move because the point is that he wants to put his knight on f3 to lend support to his central pawns, which I am obviously attacking. But if he goes knight f3, I very well may play bishop to g4, pinning the knight to the queen. So my opponent plays h3 preemptively so that I can't play bishop to g4. So his knight is very secure on f3 which is just a good move. So now I have to decide whether I want my bishop on f5 and then play e6, or do I want to go e6, lock my bishop inside the pawn chain and get my development going with my bishop out, get my knight out to e7, maybe bring my queen out to b6. So I can try and argue that the move h3 is a waste of time. That's what my position depends on in my mind here. a6 is also a good move. I could take... But then I give the knight the c3 square after he takes back. I don't really want to do that. I want to make my opponent commit his knight to a worse square, and then I can take. If I want to, of course. Um, bishop f5 is tempting, but that's not really my play style. I don't like putting the bishop on f5. I don't know why. It's just, it doesn't appeal to me, personally. I feel like it's a bit of a waste of time. I prefer to focus on the dark squares in the center, and the bishop pinning the knight does focus on the dark squares because I make it so the knight cannot participate in the central battle. But now that I can't go bishop g4, I'm tempted to go a6. Because like I said, this diagonal can become a bit of a problem sometimes. It stops moves like bishop to b5. I also prefer b5 myself in the future to play bishop to b7. e6 is probably more solid though, and it's what I'm going to play. Just defending c5, allowing my knight to come to e7, potentially come out to f5. Or maybe g6. I don't know. We can see. But my opponent's played this well, to be fair to him. Playing this well. Queen b6 looks good. Because bishop to e3 defending the pawn isn't really playable. Because I can just take on b2. That can sometimes be a poison pawn. But in that particular scenario, I think it's probably a good move to make. If I go knight e7 takes knight g6... I double attack e5 and c5 is now under attack. So that's a perfectly viable move. I can also partner it with h5 to go knight f5. 
uh, so that g4 isn't really playable. But bishop to d3 could always cause some problems for the knight. So I'm torn between queen b6 and knight e7 here. Those are my two options. I don't want to go knight h6 because my opponent should probably just take me and ruin my pawn structure. So I'm going to go queen b6. I don't know if this is the best move. I think I've had a game actually where my opponent, I believe, played a4. Yeah, I think he might have played a4 here. He like rattled off a ton of theory. It might have been in the Slav. But no, I think it was the Karo. And I got kind of crushed, to be honest. Um, basically, the pawn came out down to a5. I took it. And my queen kind of got overloaded, essentially. Um, yeah, that was not good. That was not good. I lost that game uh, pretty quickly. So yeah, okay. We have one, two, three attackers on d4. He has one, two, three defenders. So we don't need to take. We could go knight e7. If he takes now, then I would have to take with the queen. Of course, I would rather take with the bishop. But if knight e7 takes, takes. Bishop e3 is actually annoying. So maybe I take first. But then I give him the c3 square for his knight, which I said I didn't want to do. a6 is a move I could play, because like I said before, it's just a useful move. Uh, h6, I suppose, is a move, but it seems kind of like a waste of time. Bishop e7, I don't think is good because my knight wants to go there to transfer to a light square. Um, this isn't obvious. This isn't obvious, I don't think. Bishop d7, I suppose I could play. Just develop a bishop. Then I can play a move like rook c8, which is always useful. Because this file is probably going to open at some point if either of us take each other. Because I'm not really going to push to c4 anytime soon. Unless he just like gives me a piece uh, and lets me fork him. But that's not going to happen. My opponent is rated almost 2000. So I'm just going to go bishop to d7. It can't be a bad move. And to be fair, now my queen is on b6. b5, like b5 in conjunction with a6 to go bishop b7 is going to be harder to play. So bishop d7 looks fine. Rook c8... I think is also good. Um, basically, I don't know what I want to do with my king side pieces yet. So I think I've positioned my queen side pieces as well as they feasibly can be positioned in this particular structure. And, we, you know, we're still applying pressure. If he takes, we're going to take with the bishop. Then the knight goes to e7 and then everything is beautiful. I suppose, like, my opponent could do something like takes, takes and b4 to force my bishop to retreat. But that just looks really silly, especially with my rook on the semi-open C file, which is why the rook is useful on C8 for those kinds of scenarios, because the C file is going to open, most likely. Uh, by the way, I do want to say uh, quickly, I know I said in my previous, I think my previous video, my videos won't be as frequent as they used to be, just because I've got like so many commitments going on at the moment, like... It is genuinely ridiculous. I just work non-stop. And that's not me complaining because I like it and I decided to do it myself. So no pity, right? I will just get videos done when I can. And today I just blasted through my work in the morning. I had a little bit less to do than usual. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I can do a bit of a chess recording now. I, I'm really feeling it. Um, so, and also just by... Ha like happenstance, uh, Fianchetto Club merch got to me, I think yesterday or the day before. So um, yeah, I, I was pretty excited about that, to be fair. Just cool to be able to like, wear like chess clothing out and about and not feel like a weirdo. Yeah, A4. So I mentioned this earlier. This is definitely an idea. I don't, I don't know if it can be played yet. Mm, A5 is a move, but I do then give him the b5 square because i can no longer go a6 and my c pawn is too far advanced to control the b5 square i suppose my bishop can do something there but then he could also root his knight through a3 and into b5 which would be quite annoying that would be very annoying so i don't really want to allow that um again c4 is a move that i don't want to play because i don't want to lock everything up um <sighs> Knight e7 here, again takes, takes, bishop e3. Looks very uncomfortable. a6 is a move that I could play. And if a5 is played, 
maybe I can take. The reason I play a6 without fully calculating it is because I don't want to spend too long on it, right? But also, even if after a5, even if I can't take, I can just drop my queen back. Like, it's not the end of the world whatsoever. Um, she, could, she, could, she could go to a7 to stay on this long diagonal. Or she could go to c7 to put pressure on e5, stay on the c file, keep an eye on a5. So all of those moves are completely valid. You could even bring her back to d8 if you really wanted to, but I don't see why you would, um, personally. Maybe the computer would love that, and I have a feeling it probably would. But no, that's just kind of silly from a human, well, at least um, a 2000 rated human perspective. Although I don't really know if I can say I'm 2000 rated anymore, because... I need to get that back up, don't I? I need to, like, justify me saying that. Um, but yeah, we kind of thrown the ball back into our opponent's court. Our past few moves have been, like, nothing major, just minor improving moves that don't really commit anything. We're just moving pieces to more optimal squares. And it's kind of up to my opponent now, being the white pieces and theoretically being the higher rated player in this match. He really has to prove something now. And at the end of the day, I'm really the one putting pressure on the center. The way that our pawn structures are aligned should indicate that my opponent should be attacking on the king side and I should be going on the queen side. But it's not obvious how he attacks me, especially because I haven't even castled yet. And what he does take, which... I don't know, that kind of surprises me. I was expecting a move like 97... Sorry, 92... Although that might have just hung the d4 pawn, actually. Maybe rook e1 made more sense. But now, you see e5 is not quite as well defended as it used to be. Like, we're equal on attackers there. I just have to add, like, one more with a move like queen c7. And we're in business. Of course, I want to take on my bishop here. I think that's a no-brainer. The only thing I have to consider is the move b4. But I think I just drop the bishop back to e7. Maybe even f8, so I can put the knight on e7, to be fair. That might actually be better. And I can maybe even fianchetto. Although, that seems like too many dark squared holes if I do that. So, I don't know. Queen takes doesn't make any sense because of bishop to e3. So, yeah, I'm expecting b4. Because if my, if my opponent doesn't play b4, this should be a bit of a cause for concern, I think. I suppose he could just play a move like rook... Well, you know, he can't because that hangs f2. He could play a move like knight to a3. It doesn't do anything. Maybe going to reroute through c2 to get to d4. But after something like knight to a3, I do have to be a little bit careful. Because knight e7, uh, my bishop gets trapped with b4 because I lose my retreating squares. So that's worth noting. a5, okay. Interesting. So he does play it. Queen c7, I think, is better than queen a7. Because on a7, if b4 is played and the bishop gets kicked, I'm just going to get tempoed with the, with the bishop. On c7, I target two weak pawns, and we are just threatening to take on e5. Also, if queen c7, b4, I no longer have to retreat this way. I can retreat to a7 which I think is really good, because then I can get my knight out to e7 no problem. I don't have to put the bishop back on f8. So that seems like a really good thing for us. Of course, we cannot take with this with the knight because of b4, just a simple fork. And like I said, this whole a5 idea, uh, I've lost to it before. Not in this particular set of circumstances, but in this same kind of structure. So I am definitely very wary of that. And if you guys play this structure with the Karo Khan, or to be fair, just any sort of structure where the flank pawn gets pushed and looks takeable, just be very careful um, about it because it can be very dangerous a lot of the time. So really, the situation on the board is we have five of our seven pieces developed on very nice squares. I mean, you could argue the bishop on d7 isn't great, but... I mean, we're playing a Karo with a bunch of pawns on light squares. Of course, our light squared bishop's not going to be great. Our dark squared bishop is perfect. Our queen's great, rook's great, knight's great. 
We still can't take, obviously, because of b4. I'm tempted to preemptively go bishop to a7, but I think it makes more sense to go knight to e7 here and just get the final minor piece developed. Get ready to castle. Maybe not yet, because you could argue my king side is a bit weak with all of my pieces transferring to the queen side. So maybe not. I could leave the king in the center, I suppose. Um, knight g6, I suppose. I guess is uh, the next idea to attack the bishop, attack the pawn, and then I'd be threatening to take the pawn. Maybe. Maybe. You've got to be careful of some pins on the queen. Okay, here, of course, I can only go to a7 anyway. b5 might be the idea here from my opponent because if I move my knight, then I get forked. So he might want to try and take and then play a move like a6 to undermine my queen side. That's what he does. I would argue c3 is weak. I would also argue this knight is very much out of the game. But my opponent's creating a very interesting position here. Um, I think now that he's shifting his attention towards the queen side, I should castle king side. That makes complete sense to me. I think I have to take this. Um, I don't think we're in any danger, particularly. But we do have to be a bit careful not to blunder anything stupid. Knight e5 would be a nice tactic. Um, the knight defends the bishop, the bishop attacks the bishop, and knight attacks the knight. But the problem is after knight takes, bishop takes, knight takes, our queen hangs, so it doesn't work. Knight g6 looks good to me. Castling also looks good. Um... You could, you could try and take on a5, and after bishop takes, take with the king, because the queen needs to defend the knight, and then if, oh no, queen a4 though, because if knight backs, then the bishop hangs. Oh no, I guess the knight defends the bishop, but that's way too flimsy. Even if I get a pawn, there is no way I'm going to risk that horrific looking position. So, we're not going to do that. I think castling makes the most sense here. Knight... I mean, the knight could come to g6, but then I also have the option of knight coming to f5 if I want it, if I leave the knight on e7 for now. If I castle and a6 is played, is that a problem? I don't think so. I think I can just let him take me if I really need to. So that's not the end of the world. Very interesting position. I can't remember the last Karo Khan I had that looked like this, uh, to be totally honest. Maybe the rook would have been better on a8, so this rook could come to c8, but whatever. It's been done now. We're just going to castle. I think there's no point going after this e5 pawn right now because of this bishop's alignment with the queen. It's way too risky. But what we can get out of this is the fact that it ties down two of white's pieces. Uh, two of white's most active pieces, actually. So that's quite useful. F6 is an idea because you can't take because the bishop hangs, but it doesn't seem right yet. I don't know, it feels a bit weird. I don't want to take because of rook takes. Can I go, wait, if takes, rook takes, can I play knight b8? I might actually be able to, you know. If I take in bishop takes, then what? Rook to a8. I'm only vulnerable on the c file, but the c file is currently closed. If c4 is played, which I suppose it could be played, it takes a bit longer though. Um, good knight b8 now, but I don't think it's quite as good. Hmm. I don't want to go b6, because that's a pass pawn and my bishop is locked out of the game. That's off the table uh, completely. You know what's interesting? Oh, it doesn't work. My idea was if bishop takes bishop, then knight f3 first with check, and then I take the bishop back. But if knight takes, he just takes with the bishop, and uh, I lose. I just lose. So, okay, I think we can start with knight g6. I think. If he takes on b7... Oh, did I just blunder that? 
Oh, I think I just blundered a... I think I just blundered an exchange. Luckily, my opponent didn't capitalize on it. The reason I wanted to bring the knight to g6 is because I thought it just gets my knight a bit more active uh, for free, because it comes with tempo. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I could have given up the exchange there. Maybe it was viable. Maybe I could have taken the bishop instead. But whatever, it's done now. Done now. So... I think I like taking... Because once I get my bishop out of there, say I move the bishop to c5, then the queen side isn't really a problem. You know? I could even bring it to b8 to try and fight for the e5 pawn if I wanted to. Okay, he does go bishop to a6, so that puts a bit of a um, something in our plans. Cog? It's not cog. I can't think of the word. Anyway, so rook b8 or rook a8 are the moves I'm looking at. I think rook a8 more, makes more sense, so I can bring this rook to b8. Because if I move this rook to b8, then where's this rook going? Yeah, I think that makes more sense. And then I'm fighting for the a-file as well. This isn't a move, because my queen controls that square. This pawn does restrict my knight's movement, but it's also a weak pawn. So let's go rook a8. We are down in time. That's partially because I'm explaining my moves. Partially because I haven't been playing a whole lot of chess recently because I've been focusing on work over the summer um, before I go back to uni for my final year, actually. So let's fight for the A-file. Um, we're down on time. Sorry, um, I got a bit lost there. We're down on time. But we have a better pawn structure. We have one pawn island. He has two, right? The C3 pawn is a glaring weakness. We also have better development. This knight is not developed. This queen is not developed. Um, the bishop and knight are arguably fighting over nothing. Because if I just don't take the pawn, they're not doing anything. Although, you could argue my knight is fighting over nothing and being dominated by the bishop. This is a classic pattern that I talk about a lot in my videos. Because I think it's really, not only useful, but just like aesthetically pleasing. Okay, knight d2 is played. Well, knight bd2. Which means c3 is now weak. But, okay, we'll see what we can do about it. I'm tempted to go knight e7. To open up my queen's vision on c3. Open my bishop up. And then maybe bring the knight to f5. Get a tempo on the bishop. And start fighting for the dark squares. I also then open up the c file, which... Looks tempting. Looks very tempting. Hmm. Rook b8 is also a decent looking move. Maybe I can try and infiltrate. Um, that looks viable. My opponent, I think, is preparing c4, though, because the knight also helps to defend the c4 square. So what can I do to stop that? Well, I can take... I can actually take, because I have three attackers. He has two defenders. If takes, 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 my knight is pinned, and I can't take the knight on f3 with check to get out of it. So my knight rookie one, f6, looks pretty ugly. Although if the queen takes on c3 after this knight is moved, this bishop will be hanging because the pawn is pinned to the king. So the adventurous move is to take. And I think this is the critical moment of the game, whether I go all in or not. I either go knight e7 and allow c4, or I take and I try for more. At the end of the day, I always have f6. I always have f6. So, worst case scenario, I lose the pawn back and I ruin my structure a bit, I think. I think is the worst case scenario. This is definitely risky. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm well aware this is incredibly risky. But we can give it a go. We can give it a go. Because if we pull it off, we should win. Whoa. Bishop to e2. Can't I just take on um, c3? Can't I take on c3? Attack the bishop, win a pawn. 
Because remember, the pawn is pinned, and I'm still defending the knight. He has to react to that, and then my knight is no longer pinned. I can just play a move like knight g6. I'm up two pawns. I should win. And my queen can always retreat to f6. I'm going to do it. I don't know if this is correct, but we're going to do it. It is worth noting that if I take the bishop, obviously the pawn is pinned. He can sacrifice his rook for the bishop back. And my queen will then be under attack. But I can just move my queen. And at the end of the day, we just trade bishops at the end of that sequence. And I'm up two pawns. So maybe my gamble will pay off. I'm currently up not one, but two pawns. And now we just need to consolidate the position. That is all we need to do. There's no c4 anymore. So this pawn center is strong. My light squared bishop is passive, admittedly. But it doesn't need to be conquering the world or anything like that. It just needs to exist. It needs to exist so that I can eventually trade it off for my opponent's light squared bishop to get into a winning endgame. Now... Whilst I'm up two pawns, it's not obvious how I convert this position. My opponent has no glaring weaknesses because I just I just took it. <laughs> like his we his two weaknesses have now been taken. But then it poses the question of how do I continue to build the advantage because I've just gotten rid of his weaknesses. I, I suppose I could try and push this pawn down the board. Or I could try and trade pieces off. I'd probably go for the latter if I can. Just to trade as many pieces as I can. You can sometimes get yourself into a bit of a problem when you're trying to do that. Because you can end up giving up massive positional uh, problems when you're just trying to simply trade. So you have to be careful about it. But with the weakness of my opponent's second rank, if I can maybe get a rook to a2, it'd be pretty nice. I, will, I am a little bit concerned for my king's safety though, if I start doing stuff like that. And my opponent takes... Which I honestly think makes my position a lot easier. I think that makes it easier. I don't know what he should have done. I have no idea. But this seems to simplify matters. In my mind. Because his dark squared bishop was one of his best pieces. It was really difficult for me to do anything about it. Now it's gone. My knight was arguably flimsy. Because it was just going to have to come back to g6. And still be dominated by the bishop. Maybe my opponent could have just played like king to h1 to break this pin so that the bishop was defended. Then I probably would have had to move the knight. He could have played moves like rook c1 to go after my queen. But, but I'm not complaining at all. At all. There's interesting ideas of bishop f2. Because if rook f2, rook a1, my queen helps in the defense of, well, the attack of the rook, I suppose. But if bishop to f2, he can just take with the king. Although there are interesting scenarios there with, move, with moves like queen d4. I suppose queen to f6 sort of threatens that. Wait, no, that just gives me a... Okay, he just hung a rook. Yeah, I can just play bishop f2 check and win the rook. So... Yeah, that's pretty simple. The rook's undefended. I take on f2 with check. I open up the attack of the, of the rook. I think that really goes to show, once someone makes the first mistake, like, that, that's not the end of the game. You could argue that letting me have the pawn on e5 was the first mistake. Whether it was even a mistake or not, I don't know, but maybe the first, first move that my opponent perceived to be a mistake of his. But then, many, many more followed. He hung c3, he traded his bishop off, and then he hung his rook. Well, hung an exchange and a pawn. So, yeah, normally, once, like, a noticeable or, like, perceived mistake is made, they kind of just follow, and my opponent resigns, which is fair enough. He has nothing in this position worth fighting for. And that, that was a very good game. That was a really good game, a really good showcase of the Karo Khan. So I'm very happy with that. I hope you guys enjoyed the gameplay. I'm going to do a short analysis to follow this, so I would encourage you to stick around. If you're simply here for the gameplay, then I have a playlist below linked with every single video I have made on this channel, which features the Karo Khan. So I'd he I'd highly encourage you to check that out. Thank you very much for watching. Let's get into the analysis. All right, so let's get into the analysis. That was a pretty accurate game. 
80.8% from my opponent, 916 for myself. And in fairness, it was a fairly short game, so those accuracies are skewed a little bit high because the first 10 moves or whatever, you're not really going to mess up too badly in them. You're going to play pretty good moves, so that is like kind of inflated. But anyway, d4, c6. The reason I play c6, like I explained, is because against d4, c4, I play the Slav. But I would rather play the Karo than the Slav. So if I start with the typical d5, c4, c6, I get the Slav, but my opponent doesn't have the option to go into the Karo because that is just a bad move, right? So if I go c6 instead, if c4, I still get the same Slav, but I give my opponent the option of the Karo, and that is theoretically deemed to be better for the white pieces to, to uh, transpose to the Karo, except that's exactly what I want. So bear that in mind if you're a Karo player. We go d5, e5. Of course, there are so many different moves that white can play in this position. Um, there's also like different gambit lines that white can play. Uh, I'm probably missing, oh, f3, of course, the fantasy. Um, I love playing against the fantasy because I have found a bit of a, what I believe is a, not a refutation of the opening, but a refutation of the opening ideas. So I do, if you just search on my channel, like fantasy, um, in my videos, there's a video dead. There's a couple of videos dedicated to it, but the most recent one I was very happy with. So um, give that a watch if you're interested. But e5, c5. Like I said, bishop f5 is the main line, really. So I mean, like c3, e6, knight f3. I find this just insanely boring. Um, I also don't like the fact that my bishop can't come to d7 because if you try and play c5 now, which the engine likes. And that diagonal is just even weaker than with the bishop inside the pawn chain. So, okay, we go knight c6, h3, e6. The point of h3 is because if knight f3 is played, I could go bishop to g4. Although taking first and then bishop g4 is better. So that white can't take. And you can't take here with the knight because e5 hangs. So watch out for that. Anyway, h3, e6. Again, the computer likes uh, bishop to f5, but I like e6. Do whichever you prefer. Knight f3. Uh, bishop d7 was also good, as well as queen b6. Bishop b2. Bishop d7. Knight g to e7 is apparently playable. And if takes, takes bishop to e3. Queen a5. This is okay for black. But, I don't know. See, I guess it seemed unnecessary to let white develop with tempo. But I guess this bishop is just a target for the knight to come to f4. So the computer just wants to move the bishop to f4 anyway. So yeah, don't be scared of a tempo winning move, I suppose. But we go bishop d7. These are all fine moves. a6 was a bit better. a4 played by my opponent was actually a mistake here. Because I was supposed to take. And if pawn takes, just develop. And if knight takes, I take this. I don't know why this is so bad for white, but it is. If, if you have any idea, please let me know in the comments, because I'm lost. Um, but he takes. Bishop takes. And yeah, a5 is a mistake. I was expecting b4, because then I would have to put my bishop on f8, so I have the e7 square for my knight. And then, I don't know, white just looks really good. But because he went for a5 first, it gave me a chance to move my queen. And then if b4, I can move my bishop to a7 rather than f8 to stay on this active diagonal rather than this passive one which is heavily controlled by white so inaccuracy from my opponent but okay people don't play perfectly we go knight g to e7 also the computer liked putting the bishop back immediately that was its second favorite move after the move i played which i didn't mention but i i preferred to get the knight out first before bishop a7 which apparently knight g6, I guess winning a tempo first is slightly better because you can't you can't do this. This is horrific for white. This pawn structure is horrendous, and this is a very nice knight. So we move the bishop. Um, sorry, let me get back to the variation b5, and I felt like I had to take on b5. I could have done this, but I was terrified of taking on a5 because it's gone very wrong for me in the past which I guess is a bit of a weakness because 
I should look at each position pragmatically, but pa pattern recognition is also very useful in chess as well. So a bit of a toss up. White could always just win the a6 pawn anyway. So I took bishop b5 is a mistake. This is better. Interesting. If knight a5, knight b5. Bishop b5, bishop b5. Knight e to c6. I would take white here any day. Black's position looks really flimsy with all of these pins going on and the overloading of the queen potentially. But you, you know, make up your own mind on that. He took, he takes with the bishop. We castle, which was better than knight g6. So I'm happy about that. A6. And here, this was an inaccuracy. So the problem, I think, is here, here, bishop to a6. Oh, I can't take it because my queen hangs. <laughs> what am I on about? I do have queen b2, though. Attacking here? Bishop c8? Bishop c8. He has to save the rook. Rook a4 defends the bishop. Knight f4, rook f4. Bishop a6 attacks the rook. Rook e1. And then we could take on f2 with check. So you... That's so deep, that line. Like, rerouting the bishop to force the rook away from the defense of f2 that my bishop and queen are lining up on. So the only move for white is queen d2 to force a queen trade and then have a pretty equal endgame. <laughs> okay, whatever. Whatever. Bishop g3 is played. We take on a6. Bishop a6, rook a8, knight bd2. And knight c5 was a mistake. Knight b8 was the best move, which looks weird, but I did have that idea. Say the bishop goes back to d3. We take on c3, and we're better. I take on e5, though, and it was bold, for sure. And it's crazy, because the computer wants to play knight to f3. Give, like, allow my knight out with check, and then just be down a pawn. That's crazy to me. I was expecting a move like queen e2, just putting pressure on. And I was going to respond with f6. Let's say rook e1. Oh, then I just take on c3 and you lose. So c3 was a defining weakness of the white position after all. Bishop e2 is just a horrible move though. Simply because of queen c3. Um, maybe my opponent didn't realize this still defended the knight. But also carried this threat. I did, want to me I did mention as well... Let's say something like rookie one was played. If queen g3, rook a7, um, desperado is the rook, which does attack the queen. And I don't take the rook, obviously, and lose the queen. I just move the queen. And if the rooks get traded, then I'm still up like two pawns. So I was talking about that during the game. Just to help you guys visualize it. But yeah, we just trade. Rook a3 is a horrible move because of bishop f2. We win the rook. And my opponent resigns. A better way to go about it? I don't really know, to be honest. But something like rook e1 just leaves this very vulnerable. And um, apparently I can still do this, which I was talking about in the game. But I thought he had enough defenders on the rook. I did see this check. I didn't see a follow-up. Oh, the knight hangs. The queen's overloaded. Well, I suppose there was danger in the position, like, anyway. But interesting line from the computer. Maybe some of you guys saw that while I was doing some brief analysis during the game. But at the end of the day, we had a slightly worse position in the opening, brought it back in the middle game, made a bold decision, and it paid off. We saw the tactics when we needed to. And that's the Kari Okan at its finest. At the end of the day, look at the center. Look at our d5 and e6 pawns. They stood there the entire time, kept the light squares under control, kept our position solid, and allowed our pieces to work around the pawn structure to win us the game. That's the Karo Khan, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed the game. Check out the playlist below if you want to see more Karo Khan games on my channel. Thank you very much for watching.